Brett McKay here, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Art of Manliness podcast. And I gotta say, I'm really excited about this. I've been wanting to do a podcast for quite some time, and we've been getting emails from you all requesting that we start a podca- podcast for the Art of Manliness. Um, and so here we are, we're doing it. And to give you an idea of what we have in mind with the podcast, we're going, going to do an episode once a week. They're going to be between 20 and 30 minutes long. And it's not going to be me just pontificating and blabbering on about what I think is manly or whatever. I wouldn't do that to you all. What we plan on doing is bringing in experts, authors, personalities, and art of manliness readers, you all, who read the blog, and talk to them and discuss with them issues and topics of interest to men, ask them what manliness means to them, and hopefully get some advice and get some tips on how to be better husbands, better fathers, and all around better men. So that's the goal of the show, and I'm looking forward to it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the first episode of the Art of Manliness podcast. During World War II, the United States Army developed an experimental fighting force that parachuted soldiers from C-47 transport planes behind enemy lines. The 101st Airborne Division, or Screaming Eagles, is one of America's most well-known military divisions. And within that division, a company of soldiers called Easy Company took part in some of the most famous events of the Allied campaign in Europe, including, but not limited to, the D-Day invasion, the Battle of the Bulge, concentration camp liberations, and taking over Hitler's mountaintop fortress, the Eagle's Nest. The men of Easy Company have been the subject of numerous books and also the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. And our guest today has recently published a book about Easy Company. His name is Marcus Brotherton, and his book is called We Who Are Alive and Remain, Untold Stories from the Band of Brothers. Marcus is a journalist and has written or co-written over 17 books, including a memoir of Easy Company's Lieutenant Buck Compton. And Marcus lives in the beautiful state of Washington with his family. Marcus, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brad. So, Marcus, a lot has been written about Easy Company, the 101st Division, you'd think there wouldn't be anything else to say about them. So what inspired you to take on this project and write the book? That's, that's a great question, Brad. At the start of Dick Winter's memoir, he, he says that he often uh, receives letters from people, and they say things like, you know, tell us more. And uh, people, are, people are searching for as complete a story as possible about this company. For, for me personally, it was, uh, it was just a chance to work with great people. You know, these guys are, are living history and legends, and I knew I had much to learn from these men. Yeah, and you, I remember you mentioned in your, your book, and I think in the epilogue, that you, you were living in an apartment with uh, this World War II veteran, I think it was Nate Miller was his name? Yeah. 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 That, 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 well, tell us about Nate. He sounds like he kind of inspired you to, or get you to <laughs> connect you with these men. Yeah, that was it. Was back in graduate school, and I moved down to LA, and and I didn't know anybody, and and uh, he was my advisor's father. He he had just lost his wife, and and his son thought it might be good for him to uh, to have some company in the house. So I, I rented a room from this guy, and he was really my my first introduction to to anybody from World War II, sort of in in living color, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nate was he was an amazing man. He was uh, he was. Very ornery, and uh, slept with a loaded gun under his pillow. Wow! And uh, <laughs> he he just had these these amazing stories about um, you know things he had done in in the war, and it had it had really colored his worldview in so many ways. He he saw much of his life through the grid of of what he what he had experienced. Wow! And so from there, I mean, I guess I guess he planted the seed for you to. To do these projects, I mean, you've written a book with you know, Lieutenant Buck Compton, his memoirs, and then now you've written this book. So I guess he kind of planted a seed for you to do this project. Yeah, it's it's been really cool. I, I never I never thought I would write military nonfiction. I didn't major in history, but it's uh, I've been a journalist and collaborative writer. And and Buck Compton is it's just great. He he lives just about forty minutes from my house, and so we connected uh, a couple years ago to write his uh, memoir. One thing leads to another, so Buck's book got me connected with this one. So. Wow, that's great. How many men of Easy Company are still alive? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Brett. It's, there, there's probably about 30, uh, wow. although there's really no way to know 
for sure. You know, after the war, some of the men just sort of disappeared, mm-hmm. so they didn't keep in contact with any of the associations or their friends. In fact, mm-hmm. just this past week, I sent a newspaper article about a guy named Ed Mauser. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's an easy company veteran. He's still alive and living in Omaha, 92 years old, going strong. He had never connected with any of his buddies from after the war. So he's he's planning on coming to this year's Easy Company reunion for the first time in you know sixty plus years. He's going to connect with his buddies. So wow, that's great! It'll be, it'll be cool to meet him. Yeah, yeah. That something else I thought was interesting in the book that a lot of these men didn't start going to the reunions until the Band of Brothers book was written or the series was put on HBO. A lot of them didn't have much to do with it, but somehow this brought them back together. Yeah, you know, some of it was a was a coping mechanism. DeWitt Lowry, he his method of coping was really to forget. He really chose to to purposely not think about the war at all. I don't think he's ever been to a, to a reunion, although he's connected with Dick Winters and some of the other men. So, and and some of it, it was it was just a family thing where you know they came home and and started working and raising their families and whatnot, and you know life gets busy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a, a variety of reasons for doing that. Yeah. So you know, Marcus, after talking to these men, did you notice any characteristics that they all had in common that made them such a successful military company? They were an elite, highly trained fighting unit, and and definitely the training, definitely their drive. Uh, I would say the the single shared characteristic was probably determination. Mm-hmm. Many of them said some th- things like, you know, we were just just doing our jobs and we didn't quit and we didn't give up. I yeah, I think of one of the men, Forrest Guth, who uh, you know he just passed away a couple weeks ago here. But when when Forrest was jumping into Holland for Operation Market Garden, his his parachute malfunctions. So he's he's jumping out of the plane, and because the men had jumped so low on that jump, uh, below 500 feet, there wasn't enough time to open his reserve chute. So he lands, and he hits hard, and he just lands with a thud, knocks him out. When he comes to, he can't move his back or his legs. Wow. So they, they ship him to a hospital in England and uh, take x-rays and whatnot, discover he's got a broken disc in his back. Mm-hmm. And and that was it. That was his golden ticket home if he wanted it. He, he could have been, you know, excused from the war. But anyway, he uh, he uh, stays in the hospital for a while, uh, regains some feeling in his legs and his back, and although he's still under a great deal of pain, he makes the choice to go back to the front and and continue the battle with his buddies. You know, he just didn't quit. That's determination. Yeah, I, I actually noticed that there were several men that that happened to. They would get injured and be their golden ticket home. They could go home, but like they would go AWOL from the hospital and find any way to get back to the front lines with their their company. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed Joint was another another man who did that, and uh, yeah, they would rather fight than not. Wow. And, you know, Marcus, you know, one of the things, we actually wrote a post about World War II vets being the greatest generation, and it's a, it's a, I guess, a title that Tom Brokaw came up with, and a lot of people have criticized this moniker for these men who fought in World War II. Do you think the title Greatest Generation is appropriate for these men? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think, you know, the term greatest, it's sort of compared to something else. And, yeah. you know, what is compared to? I think of one of the book's contributors, uh, a guy by the name of Clancy Lyle. He he talks about how when he was engaged in combat, any time he could shoot to wound an enemy as opposed to shoot to kill, that was always what he chose to do. Uh, one time he's uh, he's fighting in uh, Normandy in the, in the town of St. Mary Glees. Uh, you know, a German pops out from behind the street, and Clancy's got a clean shot. He can take him out. He chooses to shoot him in the leg, simply just to take him out of the battle. Uh, he says, you know, as far as as far as it was up to me, that was fine, as, as long as he was not shooting back at me. Mm-hmm. A couple days later, Clancy's fighting in another town called Carentan, and if you can picture, picture it, it's close quarters, street-to-street fighting. Clancy is running around the corner of a building. Obviously, you can't see around the other side. And as he runs around the corner of this building, he runs smack dab into an enemy soldier who's got his rifle outstretched and his bayonet fixed on the end. You can picture it. The weapon just sticks fast in Clancy's gut. He runs straight into it. Wow. So Clancy describes this scene how both he and the enemy are just absolutely frozen for a minute, Mm -hmm. staring at each other. 
And fortunately for Clancy's sake, he uh, raises his rifle and gets gets off the first shot. Mm -hmm. As the enemy is falling over backwards, the enemy pulls the bayonet out of Clancy's stomach. Mm -hmm. And Clancy, as he's telling me the story, he jokes, he says, you know, I wasn't shooting to wound just then. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, you know, that's that's the type of men these guys were, and that's the type of situations they were they were encountered. Yeah. They they were, uh, you know, placed into these these extraordinary situations where they put their lives at risk. And uh, it wasn't for fame or for recognition, but because they knew it was the right thing to do. It was for the sake of future generations and our liberty. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly that's admirable. Yeah, definitely. And you know, one thing I liked about your book, as opposed to a lot of you know, other nonfiction military history books, is it's, not, it's different that you're basically just interviewing these veterans and they're let, you're letting them tell their stories and you're not really – editing it you're not you're not trying to format it you're just letting them speak and it's basically just transcripts of them telling their stories why did you go with this approach as opposed to you know a typical Stephen Ambrose history book where you try to come up with a you know cohesive uh, storyline right right yeah it's uh, it's an oral history book for sure um, and it's funny it's uh, the, the book has, has received uh, you know good reviews and, and really great acclaim across the board uh, I've received a couple of criticisms uh, from guys who basically say, you know, look, you're, you're not an author. Basically, all you did was just, you know, sort of turn on a tape recorder and, and uh, type in what you heard. And uh, not to defend myself here, but I can assure you that the project took more editorial work than that, you know. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> to yeah, to yeah. kind of a, a achieve that oral history effect. Really, I, 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 want, I want to take myself out of the way as, as an author. Uh, Stephen Ambrose says, always let the men speak for themselves. Mm. I, I, wanted, I wanted to connect readers uh, directly with a man. It's, it's kind of this feeling that they're sitting down in the living room uh, together with you and, and, and just, you know, telling their stories and, and you're getting to know these guys, you know, watching a football game together. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Marcus, I, I, I can imagine, I mean, after talking to these men, you, you can't walk away from this unchanged, you know, listening to these stories. How did writing this book and taking part in this project change you as a man? You know, thinking about the men of Easy Company training at, at Camp Tacoa in Georgia, they're running up Mount Currahee every morning, every evening sometimes, uh, three and a half miles up, three and a half miles down. And, you know, if, if they can do that, then I can certainly go for my morning jog without my usual amount of complaining. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it helps me be less of a, uh, of a whiner, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it helps me see my life's challenges and, and problems in perspective. I'm, I'm not sleeping outside in the snow. I'm not getting shot at. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it definitely it, it helps me be more grateful. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that I can write books for a living today instead of working in some factory for one of Hitler's descendants, you know, that's, that's due in part to the, to the veterans of World War II. Mm. Wow. And, so, Marcus, I mean, after, you know, talking to these men, and I'm sure you kind of gleaned some characteristics that they had, what are what do you think are some lessons that today's men of today's generation can take from the men of Easy Company? Uh, Stephen Ambrose said, uh, "All men ultimately want to know two things: uh, to whom do I owe thanks that I should live in such opportunity?" is the first thing, and the second is, "Will I have the courage when the time comes?" And uh, yeah, studying about the men of Easy Company helps us answer those questions. They have given much so that we can live for what matters. As, as men today, we're, we're often told to, uh, you know, seek lives of entertainment or leisure or, or, you know, misguided sensuality. And the big lesson for us is to, to live courageously, to live selflessly, to think of our communities and families. The invitation is to, to man up and, and, and stop playing video games all day and put our pants on and basically go do something amazing with our lives. Well, our guest today was Marcus Brotherton. His book is called We Who Are Alive and Remain, Untold Stories from the Band of Brothers. Marcus, thank you for talking with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brett. And that wraps up this edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Make sure to check back at the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com for more manly tips and advice. And until next week, stay manly.